So uh, my wife and I made a commitment to each other almost 24 years ago to promise to only aggravate each other for the entire rest of our lives and aggravate nobody else quite as much as we aggravate our, each other. That, and, and we've kept to that commitment. It, there's lots of different places where people, where all of you are coming to and coming from to be here today. Lots of different backgrounds, lots of different history that my wife and I used to participate when we were much younger. We had very little. And in order to make phone calls that used to cost money, you would go to a, a phone booth and you'd, you'd pay to make a phone call. You didn't have the, the device in your in your pocket. And, and there was this thing, this free dialing thing. What you would do is you would dial an 800 number and you would listen to ads. And for every ad you listen to, you got an extra minute free on the phone. And so you listen to a bunch of ads and you make your phone call. And this, there was this ad that kept coming on over and over and over for a new book that was out. And the ad went like this. I had a terrible childhood. Everything was miserable. And, and you know, you thought, wow, that is such a depressing way to advertise something. But it hit me that it was perfect because it was something that everybody could relate to. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this Sabbath day. Thank you for the opportunity for us to gather together in your word. May it be your words today and not ours. May we elevate you and may we hear your voice. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're, we're going through the series on where God is. And, and really, it's, it's, a, it's kind of disguised. It's really a series through John 14 and 15. And, and when we get into John, see, the Bible itself has been described as God's love letter to us. And, and so if, if the Bible is God's love letter to us, the gospel according to John is that mushy part in the middle. And all the mushiest parts of the love letter. And if that's true, John 14 and 15 is God defining what it means to be mushy in love with him. So we're going to be here in John 14 and 15 for a few weeks. And we're here today looking at John 15. And we're specifically looking at the question is, where is God within your family? And it seems to me if we, if we start looking at where is God in our family, the very first place that our minds are going to going ahead is Exodus 2012. So we'll just get that one out of the way. Exodus 2012, honor your father and mother so that you may have a long life in the land that the Lord, your God is giving you. All right. We're going to honor our mother, mother and father. Our family is going to be defined by that. And we're going to live a long time sermon over. Let's go have some food at lunch and learn. Except then we start getting the problems. What about my mother and father? What about my parents who didn't deserve honor? What about the fact that my, my mother would have considered it a dishonor for me to do what I'm doing right here, right now with all of you? Now we have a question. Now we have an issue. And then we're going to, we're going to wrinkle it further because we're going to ask what Jesus has to say about families. And I think what we're going to learn today is if we're going to focus on family, our definition of family is going to be have to be just a little bit different than the traditional definition of family. Now, I have a family member here today. In, in addition to the family members of mine that you know usually, I have uh, my, my other mother here. As I may have shared, my mother passed away in August of 2020. But I've, I've gathered moms along the way, and my my most long-standing other mother is Toby right here, who's been my other mother since I was six. And those times when my mother would say words like, I never wanted a son, my other mother, Toby, was the one who said, you're loved. So a lot of where I come from in focusing on family is that dichotomy right there. She just happened to be my mom's very best friend at the same time, her entire life. So family is going to have to take on a different definition. Now, I'm Jewish. 
because I have some old Yiddish words stuck in my head. The old Yiddish word used is mishpacha, which basically means family, but it's, it's got a connotation. Every word has a connotation, right? And the connotation of the word mishpacha is it's, it's the people that climb out of the woodwork, right? They're not the people that you go to in times of trouble. They're the people that come to you in times of their trouble, right? You don't ever hear from them on your birthday, but if you have a winning lottery ticket, that phone will ring and they're going to be there, right? Anything that, that they can get, they'll be at your door. You have those family members. We all do, right? And then there's this other word, mishpacha. That's a Hebrew word. Very similar to the Yiddish, where Yiddish is Hebrew and German smashed together uh, and, and spoken throughout Europe. But, but Hebrew has this word mishpacha, which is where mishbucha came from, and it means family. But it has a very different context, very different connotation. The idea in the Hebrew word is family in a tribal sense. Family is all those people in my community all the people that I rely on every day, all the people that I count on, my, my family, the family that are always there for me, the family that have been delivered to me. Sometimes the family we've been delivered to and the family that has been delivered to us are very divergently different. And I can tell you that my family, I mean, I don't think anybody here has had the experience of sitting to lunch with a Jewish mother and saying, I just wanted to let you know I'm going to Southern Baptist Seminary. That is just not an experience. And, and yes, that was my path to become a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. But that's not an experience that, that fits within that family structure, right? And, and family, it takes on a different context when you have that, that difficulty. And the fact is, all of our families are just as fallen and broken as we are, right? They all come, all of our families, our families we have gathered in this post-fall fallen world. In other words, this mother and father that we are supposed to honor are as dishonorable as we are and as broken as we are. And we live in a world where everything has been turned to the point where we can't see positive in people a lot of the time. And the reason we can't see positive in people is we look in people's eyes and we see a reflection of ourselves. And we see everything we've done wrong reflected back at us. So we look at them and we can't see the positive. And the people that we know that the most amount are our closest family, right? I have four children. That means I have a war in my household. Right? And if you've ever raised children, you know that no matter what you do to try and bring them together, there is always a war between them. Even when you're giving them benefits and privileges, right? They'll say, can we watch some TV? Sure, okay, everything looks fine. You guys go watch TV. What's the next half hour? An argument on what they're going to watch to the point that you finally take away the TV privileges entirely. Everything, and that is the person in your life that you are absolutely closest to. And the reason that that struggle happens with the people you are closest to is precisely because they're the people you are closest to. So you see every failure that you're ashamed of within yourself reflected right back to you. I've shared this a few times that I, I've become convinced over the past couple of months that I've been very, very wrong in my take on people who consider themselves atheists. I believed that most people who consider themselves atheists consider themselves so because they are worried about what life change it would mean if they, ha if they accepted God. In other words, they'd have to transform their life and they're not ready to do that. But I was wrong. The reality is most people who consider themselves atheists consider themselves such because they can't accept a God that would forgive them for what they've done. It comes back to that old joke of the guy who doesn't want to join any club that would have him as a member. They don't want part of any God that would forgive them and let them in, any God that would love them. This is, this is the mentality of focusing within ourselves and our families. And so Jesus speaks right into the heart of this. 
And when, when, if you go to search Jesus's words on families, it's going to be very revealing. Because when you go to seek Jesus's word on families, the first things that come up are not honor your father and mother. Let's take a look at Luke 14, 25 to 27. It says, now great crowds were traveling with him. So he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The same story is told in Matthew 10, 32 through 39. It says, therefore, everyone who will acknowledge me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my father in heaven. Do not assume that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. The person who loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The person who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Anyone finding his life will lose it, and anyone losing his life because of me will find it. When I got married, I was told, put your wife first in everything you do. That was probably the worst marital advice I was ever given. If you follow that man, you will have a break, broken family. We don't ever put our wives first. Don't put our sons and daughters first. Don't put our siblings first. Don't put our parents first. We put God first. And the only when we put God first do the rest of our family members start to fit in, in in the priority within our lives. See, the heart of what Jesus is saying here is not to turn against your family. Okay, we, we, don't observe, we don't worship a Jesus who says to hate anybody. We worship a Jesus who says, love your father. And he means love your father. To every little thing that has been done by a family member to hurt you, and every person here has been hurt, damaged, abused, and destroyed by their family. We talk within, within our current society of, of victimization, of, of emotional abuse, of, of stress among people, but I would wager that every single person who has ever lived has been emotionally abused by their parents, has been emotionally abused by family members has been hurt beyond, beyond repair by the people who are supposed to love them the most. If you are married, you have been hurt by your spouse. If you have children, you have hurt them and they have hurt you. Our families have been a microcosm of pain. We, but we get this image of God as the Father which then strikes us to the core because a lot of us look at our fathers and say, I don't want a God that's like that. And it's hard. And it's hard for us to take a look at a family structure when we are looking at our own little family structures and they just don't seem to work. But God says, I'm bigger than all of that. See, we try to focus on God as our father. And that's great. But you know who else God is? God's not just my father, but he's your father. God's not just my father, but he's my father's father. God's not just my father, but he's my mother's father. God is my grandfather. God is my father-in-law. God is my uncle because God is my sibling's father. Oh, that makes him God. My dad. I guess I got the wrong thing. There. But you get where I'm going. God is every other person's father. And when we engage with somebody, we are looking at God's child and determining how to behave towards God's own precious child that God sent his son to deliver directly. When we are looking at a person face to face, we're looking at the child of God and everything we do, we are doing to God's own child. 
And every hurt that's been taken on us has been taken from somebody who is God's own precious child. So it kind of turns things because the, the, some, some of where we're, we're putting that hurt kind of has to turn away from that person when we can't deliver it back. Right? And I think when God says, forgive not just seven times, but seven times 70, I think what he's actually saying is the person you're deciding whether or not, or not to forgive, whether or not to move on in a relationship with that person's my child and I love them and I came to this world for them. And in as much as we often love to preach that Jesus would have come if it were only you and you were the only person that would accept him, it's just as true that the person who just attacked you is also a person that Jesus would have come only for them alone. See, Jesus made this distinction. Matthew 12, 46 through 50. He was still speaking to the crowds. So this is, this is actually in, in direct relation to what, we, what he just said about hating our own family members. And it says he was still speaking to the crowds when suddenly his mother and brothers were standing outside wanting to speak to him. And someone said, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. But he replied to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and, and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven, that person is my brother and sister and mother. God is our father. Jesus is, his, is the son. And that makes Jesus our brother in addition to being the, our king and our Lord. And Jesus said, my father, my mother and brothers are not special above the other mothers and brothers here that are all part of one family. Look to your left. Look to your right. That's your family. Your sister is in front of you. Your brother is behind you. The people in these pews, that is your family. The person that's checking you out at the grocery store, that is your family. Right? And that is your family every bit as true and real as the parents that reared you. And it's interesting to me that every adopted child raised by a loving family seeks out the, the parents they're genetically related to. And every child at some point in their childhood seeks to leave the parents that are raising them see the thing is we get really direct we're all genetically related we are one family if we believe what this book says we all come from one place, two people coming from a garden, and more directly, everything was destroyed except for one family, and we all come directly from that family. We're all part of Noah's family. Noah's our great, 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 great grandfather. Right, Weldon, you were there. Noah, we are all descendants directly of Noah. We are literally genetic family together. There is no separation. And we, in being family, we recognize that our father is the father. Who were Adam and Eve's parents? The father himself. All right, we have a whole family modeled for us in the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. We have the perfect family modeled for us, one in heart, one in mind, but three in head. Right? And that's how we're called to be as a family of God. As close together as Father and Son and Holy Spirit, the Trinity seen through how we are towards our family here. John 15, 1 through 11, the mushy middle stuff. I am the true vine and my Father is the vineyard keeper. I am my identity in who the Father is. And I do what I do to make my father known. Every branch in me that doesn't produce fruit, he removes. He takes his action through the people that I connect with. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken in you. Remain in me and I in you. 
And he's already said, I am in the Father. So you remain in me. You're remaining in my Father. You're remaining in Jesus. You are connected to the Father. You are with your brother. And you are one with the, the, your dad. It says it at verse 5, I am the vine. You are the branches. There is a connectedness that cannot be split. You no longer exist and are able to live if you are disconnected. He says you are all the branches. Every branch connects together. Everything works together into one family. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. And when that branch withers, what happens to the plant? Right? When one branch withers, the plant is not as beautiful as it was. It's not able to produce as much fruit as it could. Every family member who is thrown aside is a family member that is, that, whose, whose loss has injured every member of the family. I think it all comes together in John 15, 11. I'm, I'm sorry, John 15, 10. It says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. It says in verse 9, as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Remain in my love. Make your home in my love. Dwell forever in the dwelling place of my love. And my love comes from the fact that I'm connected with the Father. You connect with me. I connect with the Father. We are one connection. We are one family unit. You know, a lot is made on whether what condition we're in now because of what happened in the garden. The fall and it transforms who we are. But I take a look at the garden and I take a look at our Father who made us, our Father who knows everything, our Father who can make all things possible. And I think he looks at us and says, I made you in my image and you look like me. You're a spitting image of, of, of me. You look like your brother. You look like my son. I love you because you are mine. And I think he said that the moment before the fall but I think he said it the moment after the fall. And I think maybe we worship a God who knew what would happen and knew where we would go with it and did it all anyway. We look at a God, we worship a God who doesn't say, oh my goodness, Satan came in and messed up everything. Satan can't mess up what God puts together. No. I think God laughs and says, Satan, you actually, you try so hard and you can't do anything but simply keep my plan going. And we fell to draw close to him. We fell to experience a love with him. We fell to experience what it means to be in family with each other. We fell in order to experience a love and a connection, to experience more than ourselves, to experience who we all are. There is an intimacy that we share with each other. And no matter where we are, no matter who we meet, we look into the person in front of us and we know that that person is God's image. There's a reason that God said not to create a graven image of himself. And that reason is because he already created the image. We don't need a graven one because you can see his image by looking at any face. And you look at a face and you see God there. So I think we have to revise our thought on who family is. And I think family goes so much beyond the people that by accident of birth we share the closest set of genes with, but it is the people that we share any genes with. I think family is every person. And I think when, when God says, no greater love has man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friend, I think by friend he means family, and I think by family he means everybody. 
And we all have the family we were born with, and then we have the family that we have chosen. But that's a misnomer, because God chose both. And there isn't a distinction between them. We get back to Exodus, it says, honor your father and mother. And if we take that and imply that that means we simply show honor to the two people that, are, that, that were the direct step above us on the family tree, I think we totally misinterpret what God has said. I think God says, saying, honor me. And the way to honor me is you show honor to every single person I've created. Because every one of those people could be your father. Every one of those people could be your mother. Every one of those people is your family. Every person you meet is your brother, is your sister, is your mother, is your father, is your uncle. Because every one of them is directly related to you genetically and directly related to you through love of God. And let me be very, very clear. I'm not talking just about people who have accepted Jesus and are Christians. It is every person who has ever been created is directly related and related to each other through God. And God calls us to honor every one of them that we may live in this land. We are called to treat everybody as family. And notice how quickly the hurts and pains of the ones closest to us will drift to the side when we realize that we have so much family that cares and loves us. As I look around the room, I see many, many faces that have transformed my life in different ways. And I see many, many people whose love has made me understand God's love deeper. And I see hearts and I see smiles and I see souls that God says, that's my child and I'm proud of them. And I think when the son came up out of the water and God the father said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. I think he was talking to me also. I think he was also saying, you are his child in whom he is well pleased. And I think he was saying that person that hurt you the other day, he was telling them that they are his child in whom he is well pleased. Where is God in our family? I think we're asking the wrong question. I think the question is, what is family other than love of our God? There is no family definition outside of our father who loves us and everybody who he created being this huge mishpacha, the family we connect with, the family we adore, the family we have chosen to do life together with. As we look around and we use this word church family, I think it's a redundancy. Get rid of the word church in it. Is our family. Our community? No, that's another word for family. Our city? That's another word for family. Our state? That's just another word for family. Our, our globe? That's another word for family. You know, the buzzword in the news these days has been inclusivity. How can you exclude somebody who's already in your family? I want you to open your arms to the next person you see and say, you know what, brother? You are my brother as close as any sibling that my parents gave birth to. My brothers, my sisters, my aunts, my mother. I was hurt by my family. But I've been repaired by the family. I've been loved by the family. And every person in here, you're a part of my family story. You're a part of that love that I share, and I see Jesus in you. When we leave here today, as you walk out here, I want people to see Jesus in you also. Because for now, we're going to say you don't get to leave your family. You don't get to say that's it for the family. That cute little girl at the front, at the at the beginning of the 
of the message, the one from the from the movie. She didn't really get to say, no, I'm not part of this family anymore. Because no matter where you go, we're still all part of the family. Welcome to my family. God bless you. Let's pray. Dear God, please bless my family here. Please be part of this family. Please, please open this family up. Please welcome everybody into our house here. Please share the love of this family with everybody in this community. And please keep this family showing that everyone that comes by, everyone nearby, everyone far is still part of the same family. In your name we pray. Amen.